Welcome to this model on single particle interferometric refractive imaging sensor, or SPR is for short, for extracellular vesicle detection. My name is Alisa Gowalobova, and I'm a research associate in the lab of Dr. Kenneth Witwer at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. This lecture is a part of International Society for Extracellular Vesicle Massive and Long Open Course. SPRS, also known as a brand name of Exaview or Leprechaun, can count and size particles captured by affinity reagents, usually it's antibodies, on the surface of the microarray chip by interferometry. In addition to this, it can also provide phenotype, phenotypical detection on a single particle level by fluorescence. Uh, smallest detectable particles uh, by interferometry is around 50 nanometers. However, our company also released a high sensitivity model, uh, which can bring your low limit of detection down to 30 nanometer. Each individual affinity reagent spot can capture up to 15 to 17,000 particles in the same spot. However, to be a true single particles, uh, we usually count approximately 500 to 6,000 particles per each spot. Uh, usually, it comes with standard configuration in the kits. For example, for human tetraspanning detection, you will have a chip which is conjugated with four different antibodies against CD9, CD63, CD81, and a negative control antibody, which is, in this case, mouse IgG. It also has an option to detect not only the surface protein on extracellular vesicles, but uh, using a cargo kit, uh, we can permeabilize, fix our sample, and detect luminal protein, for example, Syntanin-1. Uh, we can also measure the um, protein distribution in the mouse samples. In this case, we will have a slightly different uh, capture. For example, CD63 will be missing. However, we will have, in this case, like two different negative control spots, which is red IgG and hamster IgG. One of the main uh, working principles for SPRs is a change in the optical path length. Here we try to uh, represent the propagation of light, or which is also known as electromagnetic wave through the air on top, and propagation of light with the same wavelengths through the air, then glass, then air again. This piece of glass in the middle has a, a refractive index of 1.5, which is higher than the refractive index for air. So uh, light, when it goes through the glass, it changes the wavelengths. Uh, so the optical path length through the object is larger than the optical path length through the air. Consequently, the phase of the light wave is changed after leaving the glass compared to the initial travel in the air. Um, the another working principle uh, of SPRs is, in, is interference. Interference is simply the result of adding the wave of, of two light beams. For example, here on the left, we have a signal beam and we have a reference beam. So when we sum them together, the signal will be zero or very low or uh, no signal will be detected. On the other hand, uh, we have a uh, same signal beam and reference beam, but this time they travel in phase. So when we sum them, sum them together, we will have a high signal and a detector. This is called constructive interference. So how we can combine two working principles here? Uh, in single particle interferometry. So on the left, where, where no particles are present, we have a destructive interference. So very low signal. The signal beam and reference beam sum together give us zero. When the particle are present, however, so we have a change of the optical path length. So as a consequence, we also have a constructive interference happening here, and high signal will be present at the detector. Even such as small nanoparticles like extracellular vesicles with low refractive index can already affect the optical path line sufficiently to affect the interferometric signal. 
So Iris uses interferometry to measure optical pass length differences caused by a biomass present on the surface of the chip, such as extracellular vesicles or antibodies. Uh, in practice, optical pass length difference cause a shift in spectral refractivity. Uh, to detect and uh, measure sizes of nanoparticles, Iris shines a LED light uh, from the real, uh, visible LED source onto nanoparticles bound to the surface of the chips, which consists of the thin layer, a thin layer of the silica dioxide on top of the silicon wafer or uh, silicon substrate. So in, in this case, interference of light refracted from the chip surface right here will be modified when particles are present. And we will have a larger particle contrast, increased contrast when we have a larger particle, and a smaller contrast when we have a particle, smaller particles. Uh, on top of it, we can also use the fluorescent probes, which can bound to the surface of the protein in, in uh, or protein of interest on the surface or inside the EVs. And we can detect it together with uh, our contrast using a uh, camera, complementary metal oxide semiconductor camera. So how we derived a multiplex phenotyping using SPRS? So we just measure fluorescent associated with affinity regions that label proteins and RNA on or inside the EVs. And of course, we have to assume the single particle detection. Uh, we need to mention here that usually fluorescent signal are uncalibrated, so you cannot exactly tell you how many molecules are present on the single particle level here. Uh, how we interpret it, uh, how we can interpret this multiplex phenotyping. So if we measure uh, exactly the same particles using the different fluorescent antibodies, in different fluorescent channel, we can colocalize each of the channels together and uh, detect up to four different uh, fluorescent probes in a single particle level. So low phenotypical detection uh, limit is uh, based on a non-specific non binding to the negative control spots. For example, for human chips, it will be mouse IgG spots. An upper phenotyping detection limit is based on the number of captured particles and detector saturation level. How we measure and uh, derived particle size? Uh, so basically, again, uh, we measure optical pass lengths by a shift on the spectral refractivity. Of, of course, in this case, we have a few more assumptions. So uh, we assume that we have a negligible dependence on incident light polarization first. Uh, the particles are smaller than illumination wavelengths. And of course, we have to assume refractive index of EVs, which usually are known. Here we present a very, very oversimplified uh, SPRS technology formula. So to identify the particle diameter, you need to basically divide the optical pass length by refracting on the uh, refractive index of extracellular vesicle. And again, it's very, very simplified formula to estimate the diameter. So if you just look on a chip uh, after interferometric detection, you will see that all of the particles detected, like bright dots right here, they're approximately similar size. Just because EVs are below the diffraction limit, they are smaller. Uh, so what's matter here is the intensity uh, which reflect the optical path lengths. So the brighter particles here will, will be the larger particles and the very small and uh, less contrast particles will be the smaller particles. So low diameter detection limit there is around 50 or 30 nanometer in high sensitivity mode. Possibly we can stretch it a little bit down for fluorescent detection. And of course, we draw it here as a sharp line, and this is not the case in the real life. So upper diameter detection limits is around 200 nanometer. That's how basically technology works. Uh, SPRS have a 
pretty accurate size distribution. For example, we can measure the trueness of mean diameter around 10 to 15 percent from reference value. For example, if we use reference beads like polystyrene beads and measure their sizes by SPRs, it will uh, have an error no more than 10 15 percent. The precision mean of the diameter it will be within two to uh, 10 percent of CD. Uh, it performs pretty well with mixed sample population. For example, in this paper, uh, we measured uh, silica particles and polystyrene particles by SPRS. And the true diameter um, of the particles presented by the dotted line uh, for the silica particles is 68, 91, 113, and 151. And you can see that the SPR is detected four distinct population of the silica, silica particles. For polystyrene beads, we also see a four different uh, populations of the polystyrene beads uh, with true uh, measurement of 70, 90, 125, and 150. And we have slight changes on SPR detection, probably due to refractive index of the particles and the model and the system. Uh, a few practical uh, information. So usually uh, one measurement uh, on SPRs is a two-day experiment. So on the first day, you need approximately 20 minutes of hands-on time to uh, capture your extracellular vesicles on the surface of the chips, which we do usually overnight. On the second day, you wash the chips and you fluorescently label the proteins inside or outside the EVs if you want to detect uh, particles fluorescently as well. So we can run up to 9 to 16 chips uh, at read at once. And we need to remember that each chips is one sample. So and chips cannot be reused, unfortunately. So more chips can be prepared in parallel. Uh, it basically depends on uh, your free time and how much time you want to in invest in the washing the chip samples. Can technology become combi be combined with auto-assembler? Yes, and it will uh, in increase probably your throughput. It already has uh, the auto-assembler washer, which uh, reduces the hands-on time significantly. Uh, when running SPRS technology, we need to implement uh, several assay controls. Uh, for example, if you work with cell culture derived extracellular radicals, we usually recommend to use a media control uh, sample to measure uh, if your media contains some sort of protein which can interfere with the capture ability of your extracellular radicals, or if it's if some of the particles in the media control can be also detected by interferometry. If you use fluorescent detection, uh, we usually use staining-specific uh, controls. For example, if you want to detect an uh, unknown protein and you are not sure that it is on the surface or inside the EVs, you can use non-permeabilized samples versus permeabilized samples to detect the presence and localization of your protein. Um, for example, if you use a customized labeling uh, for the protein of interest, you need to use a staining reagent in the buffer uh, to make sure that your antibody uh, will not stain the spots and uh, you will not have unspecific binding to each of the fluorescent spots you have printed. So we, what we usually report when we present the data from the SPRs, of course, the first thing is applied settings, especially background controls and background controls. In addition, if you use cell culture derived EVs, we can, for example, use and present the media control samples. Um, what is not good to report, uh, for example, the single fluorescent channel with very low particles capture. So you need to have enough particle capture uh, above the background, so you can, uh, so it can be statistically significant compared to your negative control spot. And uh, it's not a good idea also to present the data on oversaturated chips because uh, in this case you will not have a single particle detection. Um, what's important to do when you perform SPRS experiment? Uh, it's Recommended to know the particle concentration or particle number which you apply to each chip. 
Uh, if you do not have this opportunity to measure true particles per milliliter concentration, you can perform a stereo dilution for particles to optimize the number of captured particles. Remember, uh, I mentioned that each spot can capture up to 17,000 particles per uh, spot. However, to be identified with single particles, you may not have more than 6,000 particles. So if you use a specific antibody or different which provided in the kit, it will be a good idea to perform a serial dilution for your antibody labeling as well. So you can identify your unspecific binding and you need to be sure that all the proteins of interest are also labeled. So we always check for non-specific binding, especially for negative control spots. So what we don't uh, do, we do not oversaturate our chips. So that's why serial dilution to uh, optimize the part number of captured particles is very important. And we, and we try not to draw in conclusion from the low particle counts uh, uh, comparable with negative control uh, spots. Uh, I'm going to show you a few good examples. In this case, on the left, uh, we have the images produced by fluorescent detection of SPIS. So every single dot you hear, it's individual EVs. So in green color, we have CD81 labeling. In blue color, we have CD9 labeling. And then a few red dots present here as well is CD63 labeling. So to quantify this, um, images, uh, we usually report a bar graphs where on the bottom on X axis, you have CD63 capture spot, CD81 capture spot, CD9 capture spot, and our uh, negative control spot, which is mouse IgG. So on and in color code, we have a fluorescent detection, which is CD63, CD81 in green, and CD9 in blue. So how to interpret this data? For example, on CD81 spot, the highest bar we have also CD81. It means so the particles captured here has at least two CD81 proteins to be able to capture using CD81 and to be able to detect it using fluorescent by CD81. Same true for all of the channels. So the good example here, uh, because we can clearly see every single individual particles by fluorescence. We also do not have a lot of capture by uh, mouse IgG spot. So and all the signal we detected is above the signal on mouse IgG spot. So one example which is not so good, of course, it might be like prettier because we have like lots of colors here and again, uh, CD9, uh, fluorescent detection is in blue, CD81 is in green, and CD63 is in red. So, however, if we look especially on CD81 spot, they all mix together. We cannot clearly see individual dots for each of the spots. And if we take a look on the mouse IgG spot, my signal on mouse IgG spot is comparable to the signal of, of each specific antibody capture spot. So, uh, what is concerning as well, we have a very flat distribution, so there is no much difference between the transpinions, which is usually not the case for most of the extracellular vesicles. Uh, there is a future development uh, for this technology for sure. For example, we can add more laser channels. It means we can detect more proteins on the same particles altogether. So automated sample uh, preparation process will increase reproducibility of handling especially. And there is a recent paper on specific RNA detection. Uh, so there is like room for improvement for RNA detection or other molecules inside or outside the EVs. There is a few references if you would like to learn more about the technology. So I will highly recommend uh, this uh, five papers which is available online. Thank you very much for attending this lecture and um, please visit ISAF website for more lectures here.